increasing on the screen, but um, not all of them are appearing. Um, Lindsay, can you see, can you let people in? I, I don't have... I see, that, I see that you've let everyone in because they've slowly disappeared from my screen as well. Okay. So it's, been, it's working. But I believe they can still, regardless of whether they're let in or not, they can still see the sessions. So... And recording has begun, so I will leave now. Perfect. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Right, I can see colleagues joining in. And I don't want to uh, use up any extra time to ensure that we do use our hour fully. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone our speakers and the audience. And welcome to our panel today on Recover Stronger, Ethical Recruitment in Global Supply Chain. Hello, and I am the Senior Regional Thematic Specialist on Labour Migration and Human Development for the International Organization for Migration based in IOM. Costa Rica, San Jose. Today we have the pleasure of having with us several distinguished guests from the private sector and from, represent, from the responsible business initiatives as well as from UN agencies. Welcome to all of you. Let me start by introducing our representative of the private sector. This is Mike McDonnell, who is Senior Manager of Supply Chain Sustainability at Intel Corporation. Good morning, Mike. Hi, thanks. Good Let to me be just here. continue then with the representative from the Responsible Business Initiatives. We have Bob Mitchell, who is the Vice President of the Responsible Business Alliance. Good morning, Mitchell. Uh, Hi. Mike. Thanks for having us. And then we have David Schilling, who is Senior Program Director of Human Rights and Resources at the Interface Center for Corporate Responsibility. Uh, sorry. Um, for, yes, that's correct. Yes. Good morning, David. And then we do have our colleague, Pavel Schallus, who is the IRIS Program Manager at the International Organization for Migration at HQ in Geneva. Thank Welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for accepting to being our panelist today. Now, before I start, I wanted to also take this occasion to inform our speakers today and our audience that there are two other um, events that are taking place within this forum organized by IOM. So specifically, we have one today at 23 to 24 hours EST on protecting migrant workers across supply chains through blockchains with the participation of the Coca-Cola company, uh, Diginex and Forum Asia. Tomorrow, we will have another panel from 7 to 8 EST for the early risers in this region, which is on building back better promoting ecosystems for inclusive entrepreneurship post-COVID with the Impact Hub. Now, um, before I go on to a small introduction uh, onto this um, panel, I wanted to inform panelists and the, um, the, the, the audience that today uh, this panel is going to be organized as following. I am going to moderate it and um, so I will move after this short um, logistic um, information on to posing questions to the various panelists. I will have one question each. I will then have one question for all. And we will have a few minutes at the end for um, the audience to pose their questions. So I would encourage the, the audience to please 
please write their uh, questions onto the chat, just um, on the side of the video, so that panelists will be able to actually see the questions coming through and pick and choose the one that they will be able to, to answer and they prefer to answer. All right, then the short introduction. Countries globally and in our region, the Americas and the Caribbean, continue to be a source, transit and destination of rural to urban, intra-regional and international migration. The presence of large informal sectors and economies, the weak social security systems, instability and natural disasters remain the main drivers of migration, pushing large sections of the population to look for employment opportunities abroad, mainly in the United States of America and in Canada. But increasingly, also within the region, through the use of informal and regular channels, personal contacts, as well as unregistered brokers or agencies. Irregular migration remains a challenge in this region, caused not only by um, lack of information about regular migration channels, but also by the inability for migrant labor to access these channels. Now, while countries often pro provide valuable and needed labor support for this region, some countries of origin are still struggling to apply regulation and guidelines to guide international uh, recruitment practices, with the result that private employment agencies and other contractors and subcontractors often operate without registration or control. Now, despite several countries having established bilateral labor agreements to regularly supply the region with migrant laborers, some agreements still apply the so-called workers pays business model, <laughs> which is indeed effectively based on unethical recruitment practices. The lack of control and regulation exposes, as we know very well, migrant workers to real risks of exploitation during the recruitment and deployment phases by unscrupulous labor brokers or recruiters that actually charge fees, some of which are very high, and provide misleading information about the job offer exploit inspiring migrant workers through false promises and coercion, and expose them to becoming victims of human trafficking, forced labor and debt bondage, and abuse in general. Now, concluding, I can say that IUM has developed a specific tool to promote ethical recruitment practices globally. This is the International Recruitment Integrity System, or in short, IRIS, which is a global initiative designed to promote ethical recruitment and transform radically the international recruitment industry for it to be fair for employers, recruitment agencies, and migrant workers. So to be a win-win situation for all. This will be probably introduced by our colleague, uh, Pavel, today during the panel. Now, without further ado, let me move on to the questions that we have prepared for our panelists. And uh, so we have several questions that should allow panelists to actually um, present some of the tools and good examples that they have come across during their work. Um, I will remind panelists then to kindly take one or two minutes to explain who you are working for, so what's your company doing and who you are. So the first uh, question will go to Bob. Hello, Bob. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us what are 
the leading challenges currently faced by multinational enterprises and their supply chain business partners related to labor migration, international recruitment, and the protection of migrant workers. In addition, I was wondering if you could tell us where can companies start with a targeted stepwise approach. Thank you very much, Bob, you have the floor. Great, thank you. Um, welcome to all the panelists. Thanks for IOM and the UNGC for having the RBA out here to speak today. Um, so my name is, uh, again, Bob Mitchell. I'm Vice President at the Responsible Business Alliance. Um, we're a coalition of over 170 companies working to promote um, uh, the rights of workers uh, within supply chains uh, on top of uh, doing a significant amount of supply chain environmental work as well. Um, the, the topic of traffic and forced labor is um, our most, I would say, our most material or salient issue within the industries which we represent. It's founded by uh, a core of electronics companies and has been extending out into a multi-industry and multi-stakeholder approach on traffic and forced labor through one of the initiatives of the RBA called the Responsible Labor Initiative. Um, the core work of the Responsible Labor Initiative is focused on um, the application of due diligence on traffic and forced labor in international supply chains and the fundamental reshaping of um, recruitment, um, the, uh, the economics around recruitment um, in order to um, work towards eliminating um, traffic and forced labor when there is migration for, uh, for work. So when really taking a look at um, the challenges that the companies who work with face um, as they implement uh, their standards within supply chains, it's, I think it's becoming um, uh, quite self-evident the, uh, the standards that need to be applied here in terms of uh, protecting workers from, uh, from the conditions that may contribute to um, modern slavery, um, things like recruitment fees um, being charged during, uh, during recruitment and migration uh, leading to debt bondage, substitution of contracts, withholding of personal information and documents, um, uh, freedom of movement and the um, inability to resign from a position. All these are examples of conditions that can pile on in different levels of severity to create a forced labor situation. Um, however, this looks different in almost every context. Um, there are some commonalities, but you know, for instance, the, 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 the documents that may be um, uh, withheld as an example to create leverage over a worker, in some cases, uh, maybe a passport, that's the most popular one, but sometimes there are school papers, a diploma. In other cases, they might not be a document. They might be um, materials of, um, or, sorry, um, possessions of material value, wedding rings, things like that. Um, so these um, uh, artifacts that can create leverage over a worker, as an example, can change co context to context. The actors also within migration um, may change very rapidly as well. Um, in some cases, um, it's traditional recruitment through um, a labor agency channel, whether that be in the Americas, Europe, or, or Asia. Um, and in, 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 other, in other cases, it, it may be um, uh, a, the placement of a student through a, um, an internship program. Um, and uh, in other cases, it might be a state facilitated migration uh, for work over international boundaries or even domestically. Um, but what we found is that in almost every case, if you put the template of the risks that a worker faces over their journey for employment over any one of those contextual situations, um, it, be, it makes it much easier to determine whether or not, not that violates those international standards around uh, modern slavery. Uh, so there are ways through this. Um, I'd say another one of the challenges is, is um, uh, extending beyond the sphere of influence of a company. In many cases, a company has quite a bit of influence over um, the first tier of their supply chain, um, uh, but as they get successively deeper into their supply chain where the risk might be higher, um, or even in some of their first tier, uh, they may not have the, uh, the spend profile within that uh, specific facility or set of facilities to actually influence change, especially where it may be um, legally 
uh, allowable, but not uh, up to international standards. Um, and so this idea of coming together and uh, to collectively act uh, in a similar way and apply the right amount of leverage um, as an industry or set of industries becomes even that much more important. Um, I'll say a, a, another uh, issue we've seen uh, come up is, especially with the, the evolution of international regulations, whether they be focused on procurement-based requirements, um, which are clear about uh, goods and services uh, sold to that entity not being made with forced labor, or um, in some cases, the potential for um, uh, criminal liability or the stoppage of goods entering into a specific country. Um, there's a rise of these, and in many ways, that's good for companies. Um, in other ways, it begins to uh, create um, sort of a challenge between a compliance-based mindset uh, for companies um, and, a, and that of, that of a, a progressive-minded company, wanting to actively seek to solve problems, um, identify the issues related to traffic and forced labor, um, and eliminate them before they become a compliance issue. Um, and so we see some companies um, re retreating into compliance-based mind frames and others uh, leaning in very progressively in this case. Um, I'll say one of the last ones here, um, because I know that there's, uh, you know, we've gone for quite a while about these challenges, um, it uh, has to do with um, the, the current context as it relates to the global health crisis and the way this begins to expose the vulnerabilities um, that, a, um, that a, um, uh, a vulnerable population may be subject to. And so um, in this case, the challenge for many of the companies is being able to detect and adapt um, to what's going on uh, in, a, in a significant change um, and disruption in the model that they were trying to uh, exert some due diligence on in the first place. And so suddenly that begins to fall apart um, because of um, um, a, uh, a global pandemic like we're facing. Um, and then companies have to adapt quite quickly to understand um, the conditions um, in the interim and how to recover from that over time. Um, hoping we get to sort of explore that through our different uh, panelists today since it is an important topic right now. When we think about how companies can really start to, um, to work through some of these challenges, um, you know, one is to start with a basic due diligence approach. Now that this is, this is supported by many international standards, um, but uh, it really is rooted in um, cycles that we've seen for quite a while in the business community. Um, and the first is really to, to say what uh, what uh, standard you want uh, to be adhered to within your, your business community that you work with, with your business partners. Um, be quite clear um, on uh, the policies and establish the management systems and the communications with your supply chain in order to um, not leave any gray area. Um, then iterate um, through a series of um, risk identification um, uh, activities um, working through uh, capacity building to cease, prevent, and mitigate issues on the ground, um, ensuring you're participating in remediation where it's necessary and providing a voice to workers um, that's legitimate and independent, um, and then monitoring progress and, and being transparent about that. And this is not a static um, cycle that you conduct one time. Um, it iterates. You get further and further down into... Um, your own operations, but also those of your suppliers um, and their suppliers and your recruitment partners as well. Um, and I can't stress enough the importance of collective action in this case. Um, it's one thing for one company to, um, to say what they want and drive that down into a very narrow slice of an international supply chain. It's a much different thing for companies that represent trillions of dollars in revenue throughout the world to come together and exert their collective influence and leverage um, past their first supply, first tier suppliers into second tier, third tier, and through the recruitment partners as well. Um, I'm proud of what we've done within the RBA and the Responsible Labor Initiative to date um, in terms of bringing um, you know, roughly 10 different industries to the table um, and um, driving a significant amount of recruitment fee repayment, return of passports, the correction of um, broken contract um, schemes, 
um, and other progress we're making um, over time. And looking forward to the opportunity to work with um, with partners like those we have on the phone, um, integrating our, our systems like we have in our responsible recruitment program with IOM's IRIS program, um, and showing the complementarity of those and um, helping uh, the private sector and international community drive this forward. So I'll pause there, um, hand it over back to you, Michaela, for, uh, for additional comments from our, from our uh, guests here. Sorry, I had muted myself. Thank you very much, uh, Bob. I think that you were quite clear and encouraging, actually, in uh, the approach, yes, the challenges are many, uh, but you also said that um, it is really quite evident, the standard that need to be applied. And you stressed also the uh, vital importance of acting and coming together as, as industries, as essential indeed to, to um, address the challenges. Now, remaining on the challenges, but with a specific focus on um, by the, the private sector, I wanted to move to Mike. And my question is the following. Mike, could you tell us what key steps have been taken by global companies or supply chain employers working in partnership to overcome such challenges? Thank you very much. You have the floor. Yeah, thanks. Uh, glad, glad to be here with everybody. Uh, Mike McDonald from Intel. Corporation, we are a semiconductor maker based in the U.S., but we have our own factories around the world in the Americas, Europe, Israel, Asia, as well as a very robust supply chain. And about six years ago, we really recognized that the risk of forced and bonded labor could exist in our supply chain. And before I go to the external for a minute, if this is the start of, of any of your journey in this area, focusing on this issue, I'd strongly recommend you know, spending the, the time to understand the issue and then getting internal alignment is, is very critical. And we did that very early and got very senior um, support to go after and focus on this issue. And it's, it's served us well because it is going to be a long journey. Uh, and, and many of you would, would face the same kind of length of journey. When I think about external collaboration and collective work, as, as Bob kind of called it, it's, it's critical at every stage. I think from our learning stage, if you will, just to kind of understand the issue, we work with others in the private sector, NGOs, SRIs, you know, to kind of say, those who have gone before us a bit and tackled this issue and tried to work on it in different industries, what have they learned? What, what do we need to consider and think about? Because uh, it probably existed in our supply chain, but we didn't really recognize it. So why, why weren't we finding it? What was, what was wrong with our approach? We, of course, prohibit forced and bonded labor and modern slavery, but we weren't necessarily seeing of it, a lot of it. And, and the electronics industry as a whole was not necessarily seeing a lot of this in, in the 2013, 14, 15 timeframe. So I think one is that, that learning. Number two is then, as Bob talked about, and I'll just expound on, is the criticality of having a common set of standards. We very quickly set our own standard and said, you know, it's going to be an employer pays model. We're not going to try and define what's too much of a fee to pay, what's excessive, whether someone could hold a passport voluntarily. We said, no, nobody's holding your passport, even voluntarily. We just we drew very sharp, clear black lines uh, in anticipation of where we felt the world would eventually go on this topic. And rather than change and reset ourselves, we, we did that and then worked collectively across different RBA members to try and gel on those those same kind of principles and then that turned into very strong change in our code of conduct within the rba around early 2016 and then we had this common uh, set of standards that we could then carry forward now not everybody carries it forward at the same pace or with the same passion or same urgency uh, but we at least when we do we're saying the same thing we have the same expectations so then you move into how to kind of um, role model to hopefully inspire others to join you uh, or cajole others into joining you in some way or to, to use the, the services of an RBA or an RLI to help convene different uh, companies together when we butt up against a challenge with a supplier. And we've got examples of that where we've been less than a percent of a supplier's business and we can yell very loudly and very passionately and we do 
um, and, and not want to step down. But at, at less than a percent of somebody's business, it's very hard for them to get excited unless there's other people at the table, other companies at the table. We'll escalate. We may stop new business with them. But eventually, being able to somehow come together collectively uh, is, is incredibly important. And, and we have cases of that. We're working cases of that right now with the, with the help of the RBA and ROI to try and, try and bring several of us together. So I, in, I encourage you to help you do that in that tactical space. And then, like I said, all along the way, to find best practices to, uh, to kind of um, share. You know, you, you have a duty as you go along your individual journey, really, I believe, to be sharing what challenges you've had, what's worked and what's not worked in this space so collectively we can make make some some faster progress and and really kind of support the the, the thought leadership that's kind of come ahead of us in fact and and see if we can't deliver on that at a, at a faster pace than than we've done done in the past so that that's kind of uh, our, our focus um and and continue to really appreciate those other actors be it ngos sris associations who really want to uh go down that journey together and, and see that, that shared benefit. Thank you very much, Mike. You focused on, um, again, similarly to, to Bob, on, on very critical issues, which is the, the essential uh, result that has uh, the, the the fact of coming together collectively has, and the power that this brings to um, the action that can be taken, actually to see that this is bringing results, so this is bringing returns to everyone. And you've also focused on the importance of finding out from uh, partners and stakeholders what are the lessons learned. A lot of um, the partners in the same industry have indeed gone through similar challenges and have approached them in a more mm -hmm. or less successful way. So thank you very much. I'll move then now to David. And the question is the following, David. Could you tell us what is the role of investors in promoting ethical recruitment in global supply chains during the pandemic? Thank you very much. You have the floor. David, we cannot hear you. You probably have a mic muted. Okay, here we go. Uh, so it's yes, great to perfect. Be here and Thank working you. Working with uh, friends and colleagues, uh, and the IOM has been very much involved in the work that investors have done through, like, the leadership groups and responsible recruitment, the responsible labor initiatives, etc. So. First, uh, the Interface Center, uh, Corporate Responsibility, uh, where I've worked for almost 26 years, started in 1971. And it had, at that point, uh, a small group of uh, faith-based organizations, uh, Protestant uh, denominations in the U.S., uh, the National Council of Churches, and then later Jewish funds, uh, you know, uh, Muslim uh, funds, uh, Catholic certainly. So uh, since 71, the, the way in which uh, the Interface Center has worked, each of our members own public equities as a part of their investment strategy. And so rather than just do that haphazardly, uh, the whole concept was to engage those uh, companies that our members own shares in to develop human rights policy. And in the first, you know, years, it was all about South Africa, where our partner was there, the young minister uh, of the National the Council of Churches there, contacted ICCR. Uh, he uh, later became Archbishop Desmond Tutu and has been a strong supporter all the way through. But he really said to ICCR, utilize your role as shareholders in companies to uh, make a difference and get U.S. companies to withdraw or at least to adopt the Sullivan Principle for fair employment in South Africa. So through you know, 20 years, about 265 uh, U.S. companies withdrew, and it was one part of the overall anti-apartheid movement that led to one person, one vote, and, uh, and Nelson Mandela becoming uh, president. So human rights has been with us for a long, long time. 
Uh, I would say on this issue, uh, in the early 90s, because we can file shareholder resolutions, usually under the Security and Exchange Commission here in the U.S., that go to a vote of all the shareholders of a given company, we started really utilizing that role to get international uh, labor standards incorporated into codes of conduct for supply. And so that began to happen in the early 90s, really got more traction in the mid-90s. And uh, then there were a number of movements that really solidified in getting a codes of conduct with, with monitoring programs that would actually not only have policy but implementation. We've always had a, a bias, if you will, uh, is make sure that companies that we invest in, in their policies and practices, make a difference for workers. That's more of the kind of the litmus test uh, for our, our members. Uh, over the last 10 years, we've been joined by large asset management firms, some public pension funds, uh, foundations, and so forth. So we have over 300 institutional members working collectively, collaboratively to engage companies. And part of the, it was interesting because part of the, the code process called out, of course, you know, the two conventions. Uh, that the ILO promulgated uh, related to forced labor. Uh, and yet, it wasn't until like 2004, 2005, we really started to look at modern slavery, which is kind of a way of talking about what happens to workers if they're recruited uh, sort of in an exploitative way. Uh, it, there are other mechanisms, but that is a significant mechanism. So in 2005, we got really, really involved in Brazil. Uh, there was a report that came out in the Bloomberg uh, News that there were workers that had been forced into the Amazon to cut trees in the Amazon, make charcoal, that went into pig iron, and from Berlin to you know New Orleans, you would have the pig iron coming into these fields. Uh, companies in this country. So you had steel companies, automotive companies, uh, you had the you know, home appliances uh, companies, all with a concern then that they were implicated in uh, modern slavery and forced labor. So at that point, we immediately got in touch with the, uh, the National Pact for the uh, eradication of slave labor and learned that a law had been passed in 1995 by the government that put together a independent mobile unit of the Ministry of Labor, uh, but it was independent to look at complaints that were lodged by uh, civil society and one of our partners there, the Capital Land Commission, uh, a, a religious organization that's affiliated with the uh, Catholic bishops in uh, Brazil, Brazil, plus uh, Leonardo Sakamoto, who did a lot of supply chain research that made the connection between the recruitment, the workers being forced into very severe situations, often very remote, and then they would investigate. So this got us on a stream whereby we were looking for, you know, not just the policies and sort of in implementation strategies that would audit at the factory, but also how did, how did workers get to the factory or the farm or the seafood vessel? And therefore, we started really focusing on a campaign related to what we had then called like no work to pay fees, no fees initiative. And that had some impact on the electronic sector. We had like a, a multi stakeholder, uh, you know, kind of gathering, a round table in January of 2015, where we looked at all these issues and uh, the responsible business alliance that made some changes you know, to make. Fees, zero fees, not you know, not just uh, excessive fees, etc. And that really laid a framework so that we then, as investors, have engaged companies uh, to put in place these policies and practices: no work to pay fees, passports, etc. But also encouraging them to get involved with, with collective action. Now, since uh, COVID-19. You know, some of the discrepancies that we've always seen in the, the global supply chain system, where you know, workers are often low-wage workers, and there's not a lot of room uh, to have money that can you can fall back on. And with COVID-19, we've seen this in, in dramatic terms.
So, for example, we have put out letters to about 45 apparel companies uh, that really look at the focus around what are their responsibilities in terms of responding to uh, furloughed or laid off uh, workers. And uh, so that now is getting responses from companies. We're setting up meetings. We engage companies a lot. We believe that dialogue can really move uh, the needle. And also as an organization, we did a COVID-19 investor statement that now has about, uh, about 350 global investors signed on with about 10 trillion uh, assets under management, $10 trillion assets under management. So in other words, it's no longer just SRIs and faith-based organizations. It's some of the largest funds in the world that are looking at these issues. And the, that statement talked about, you know, paid leave. It, it talked about issues to maintain supplier relationships and make sure that small suppliers and workers are not being hurt and to the, to the extent possible, keeping those business relationships uh, going because you're going to need them uh, to build back. So at this point, I think we put our kind of emphasis in a process whereby, A, uh, working with migrant workers, working with initiatives like the Responsible Labor Initiative that we're very involved with, uh, and investors are now starting more and more to look at the S of EFT, uh, environmental, social, governance uh, policies, and therefore we're gaining some uh, traction with some of the uh, larger funds, and we hope that as economies open up again, that we can rethink what uh, uh, an ethical, uh, equitable, resilient supply chain can look like, so that the the lessons learned from COVID-19 can be, really be put in place on behalf of it. And I think one final thing, because I, I don't want to take too much time here, but a word about IOM, a word about uh, the ILO. So important that the UN system uh, in its various uh, departments uh, are behind this. And of course, 20 years ago, the UN Global Compact was uh, uh, put together uh, with, with a Kofi Annan appointing John Ruggie to do that. Later he did, brought us the process that led to the UN Guided Principles of Business and Human Rights. So there are tools there, there are standards there, but the will, where is the will? And I think through collective action with the help of IOM, ILO, uh, like the RBA, uh, Leadership Group Responsible Recruitment, Consumer Goods Forum, and others, whether we're talking about the Americas, whether we're talking about that, that corridor between Nepal and the Gulf, uh, we have to have a global uh, system and really try to rebuild a more equitable and uh, sustainable uh, system. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I, I really liked how you make the transition from uh, starting to advocate for improved working conditions and recruitment conditions as an interface organization, but then actually uh, grabbing the interest of large companies, the um, electronic sector, first of all, responding very positively, then governments, then um, UN agencies. And, and this actually also, again, stress the importance of um, collective action, bringing all the actors, stakeholders together to actually show that um, the activity is going somewhere and it is bringing results. I will then now move to my colleague, uh, Pavel Shalos, for, which I have, for whom I have the following question. Pavel, could you tell us what role do stakeholders outside of the private sector, in particular UN agencies, play in the design, development, and implementation of supply chain strategies, and how can this be enhanced? Thanks, Pavel. You have the floor. Thank you, Michela. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for having me with you today. Uh, I won't be talking about introducing IOM because Michela already did it. So I'll just quickly jump into the, into the uh, topic. But before we jump into the role of the UN agencies in design, development and implementation of the supply chain strategies, I would like to take a minute 
and refer, uh, refer to the point made by David and focus a little bit on who are those different stakeholders uh, and their roles uh, when it comes to uh, recruitment in global supply chains. Uh, the, fact, the fact is that there are many stakeholders, uh, but let me focus on some key ones. Private sector, obviously, is the vital and critical actor in implementation of ethical recruitment. The business creates demand and facilitates supply, especially when we talk about the recruitment industry. Uh, but private sector, as much as it's a very vital one, it's not the only one which is critical. The other stakeholders are, just to mention a few, the governments, civil society, <clears throat> and also international organizations, amongst other stakeholders as well. The governments. The governments create the formal framework and regulate demand and supply through regulatory and other formal mechanisms, such as like quotas, temporary worker programs, or bilateral level arrangements. As said, the government plays a vital role in shaping up the frameworks for ethical recruitment corridors through which the migrant workers are recruited within the supply chains globally. Civil society, in its turn, play another vital role, but on a, in a different context. They are bringing the worker voice and worker perspective into the policy discussions and solutions and very much actual engagement, uh, sorry, and very much actual implementation. The civil society, through a direct outreach with migrant communities, ensures that the two-way two communication from and to migrant workers are maintained, as well as the workers are engaged in the process. All of those stakeholders, mentioned uh, a bit earlier, uh, play a vital role in ethical uh, labor recruitment to function, and they all need to work together. At the same time, the communication among those stakeholders is often limited and not always super mm -hmm. well coordinated. Mm -hmm. And this brings me to the one, the first key point, why, what can be the role of international organizations and UN agencies. Mm -hmm which is related to communication and networking. Sometimes, stake, stakeholders within the same group have a limited possibilities to talk and coordinate across the borders, especially between the countries of origin and destination, the governments and the jurisdictions of countries of origin and destination, the recruiters, sometimes civil society don't know each other on both sides of the process. International organizations such as IOM, ILO and other players play a very important role of a convener. This involves reaching out and engaging in with all relevant stakeholders, passing communication between those stakeholders, sometimes what we refer to shuttle diplomacy or shuttle communication, before they even sit together in one room. But even more substantively, uh, the UN organization are creating more tangible dialogue platforms where the brands, employers, recruiters, the government officials can comfortably sit together at one table and discuss needs and challenges and work out solutions. While different stakeholders are often busy with competing priorities of their primary businesses, uh, they have limited opportunities to talk things through in great details and coordinate among each other. That brings me to another role which the international organizations have. It's the policy support. Those situations I mentioned are often leads to the situation when there is a common understanding and consensus among the stakeholders, but because of the competing priorities amongst them and inconsistencies in policies and subsequently implementation remain not addressed. This is particularly relevant and challenging with cross-border recruitment where the objective amongst the private sector and the government might not be the same in the same country, they do not match. Moreover, we all know that there are gaps and inconsistencies in the policy and regulation between the sending and receiving countries mm -hmm. related to li licensing regimes and requirements, approach to recruitment fees and costs, approach to protection of migrant workers at large. The job of international organizations is to a large extent to bridge those gaps and to help sort out inconsistency across the board. This is done through the support of development of international standards and frameworks, which serve as one single reference point for national stakeholders, both private and public. Those standards are very often close to the ones mentioned by Bob, Mike, and David. In fact, those mentioned by Bob, Mike, and David were very often developed earlier than the international standards, because we in the UN, UN 
um, family, we are rather slow because we have a lot of stakeholders to get together, mm. obviously. But the fact that those international standards facilitate and agreed upon by international community are close to the ones by RBA, international com uh, companies, is a good one. The UN agencies, by setting up those benchmarks, bring, first of all, consistency to those standards, to those different standards, something with both, both, both my and David mentioned earlier, they give international coherence and allows those standards to serve as a one reference point for more global applications, overdue recognition. The ILO general principles and operational guidelines for fair recruitment or IRIS of IOM are referenced in a number of in regional and intergovernmental agreements, not to mention the UN Global Combat on Migration, which was signed by over 150 uh, governments in December 2019. Additional, increasing number of national governments have been requesting IOMs and ILO support to develop or strengthen their policies on the regulation of recruitment consistent with ILO and IRI standards mentioned above. Increasing number of international brands now sees those standards as a reference point and has been approaching us to support aligning their own code of conduct and supply chain strategies with provisions of those standards of IOM and ILO. That brings me to another uh, point and the role of the international uh, organizations, which is related to capacity building and implementation support. Because the role of international organizations, especially the UN ones, goes beyond just the policy advice for the government and brands on international recruitment. Once the policies are aligned, we spend a lot of time on training, strengthening the capacity of the governments, both central and local, capacity of brands and their suppliers and recruiters to enable them to practice recruitment in keeping with those international recruitment standards. For this work, we have a lot of tools available, such as, I know that RBA also has a lot of tools available, and the good news is there's consistency between those tools. And those tools are the standards itself, interpretation guides and guidelines for those standards, training curricula, capacity building programs, toolkits, auditing programs and guides. We even have a voluntary certification of private recruiters available as a tool. Once the stakeholders are connected, their policies are aligned and implementing actors capacitated, international organizations like IOM and ILO can and often do support with facilitation of setting up and ethical recruitment corridors where the rules are clear, established and adhered to by all the participating stakeholders. To ensure that this is happening, international organizations often facilitate setting up and coordination of the oversight mechanism to ensure that all the actors, including the IOs in, uh, themselves, are accountable for the actions and migrant workers are protected. Allow me to end with the final thought that the local context in various places around the world can be different and solutions that work well in Asia might seem not applicable in America, for instance. At the same time, from our groundwork in many countries around the world, we managed to identify that even if the context is different, the underlying problems and challenges, especially those related to protection of migrants' workers, remain the same across the board, around the world. That is why the international standards as a reference points are equally applicable around the world in all those places. At the same time, being a global UN agency with significant operational footprint around the world, gives us opportunity to be exposed to different scenarios and solutions, learn from them, and cross-reference them and tailor-made to any local context by proactive engagement and dialogue with local stakeholders, which will make this happen. Thank you very much, and over to you, Mike, Michaela. Thank you very much, Pablo, for this um, quite comprehensive view of the whole of UN agencies in, in supporting the stakeholders in, in promoting ethical recruitment practices. You have focused specifically on uh, the, the bridge that um, UN agencies can, can be uh, to bring together the various stakeholders that don't necessarily know each other, don't necessarily trust each other, do not know how to talk to each other. And you stressed the importance uh, that um, agencies such as IOM, ILO, 
um, recently the UN Global Compact on Migration can give on supporting and, and guiding the development of policies. Now, a question for everyone in the remaining time. I would request, if you can, to focus on this just for a couple of minutes each. We don't have much uh, left. Uh, it's already 12.50 in Costa Rica, so 10 minutes to the end. Um, so I, I would like to um, offer you the possibility, whoever wants to intervene, um, on what kind of recommendations you have um, for the audience so that you know is very large, is very um, diverse, um, specifically on what kind of steps you think have worked most um, and, and what you recommend could be something to be taken into account uh, for the way forward, especially considering that we are hopefully coming out of a very... Um, heavy crisis, first, the first one that um, we have seen as a United Nations for sure, and that in fact many countries in this region are still in the very middle of it. Thank you very much. You all have the floor. You can um, intervene just by, um, your, your mics are open, so. Well, I maybe I'll get. To, I can see a hand. Oh, right, Bob. Oh, really? Sure, I'll, 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 get, I'll get started with a couple of um, items. And yeah, you know, one is to listen and another is to act. So um, one of the, I think, most valuable things we've found is not only having a, a community of practice where people can learn from each other, um, build off of each other's efforts to refine and improve them, um, but also to get diverse perspectives. Um, not just within the private sector, um, but with our partners in the investor, civil society, uh, international governmental organization, and other communities out there that begins to change your the, the way you look at an issue and a problem and its urgency. And, and so that's one of the big lessons I think we've learned is that this is in isolation. This can either become... Um, you know, uh, one of a range of things, one being it can become very ivory tower, right? And then uh, not implementable when it comes to the complexities on the ground, which they are immensely complex when you get deep into location and remediation. Um, and then the other is too much retreating and not being inspired to get out there and, and, and be progressive and find the problems and correct them. And we found the community of practice coming together and the multi-stakeholder aspect of what we do really helps sort of right size the efforts um, and coming at that together um, certainly begins to create uh, the right action. And, and then the next is the act, right? You can't just listen and create the right approach. You actually have to get out there and roll your sleeves up and dive in and, make sure you have your battle armor on because it's, it's definitely, uh, um, you know, not for the faint of heart um, in terms of what you see uh, on the ground, how difficult it is to tear down the veils behind which this, uh, um, these conditions are found um, and the criticism you might take along the way in terms of your approach um, from either side of the aisle. So um, again, I'll encourage everybody, listen, collaborate and act. And uh, in that way, we'll, uh, we'll make a lot of progress. Thank you. Yes, Mike. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I'd add a you know, building on that. You know, we started, um, you know, th there's a lot of information out there on where these risks exist at this point now. It's, it's even greater than it was five, six years ago when we began. And so even as you're thinking through the whole process, I'd encourage people, if you've just begun this journey, to, to look at your supply chain and decide where this risk may be higher. Certain countries, certain recruiting corridors are, are have a higher propensity of this uh, to be occurring. And getting involved in that, if you know how to do the, perform the due diligence, then go do it. If not, there are many people out there who can help you go do that. Through that simple act, you will start attacking the problem and you will learn a tremendous amount of information. On the other end, um, you know, going forward in challenges, I, I like, Pavel, how uh, you kind of put it together. I like the, the word platform. When we look at this, we can kind of keep pushing and kind of telling people almost like when they're coming to your house, hey, drive over to my house and be safe. But I can't control that whole route. I can't control how fast they went, what the speed limit was on the road. I can try and do my best as somebody inviting that, but I, I need other parties. And I like the idea of a platform where 
government, civil society, and uh, companies or private sectors coming together, maybe on a more frequent basis, to kind of identify where are risks seemingly um, unsolvable right now, and we need to apply a different approach to them that, that could be a collective uh, approach and collective discussion. So I would I'd welcome kind of experimenting in that space, um, not even assuming we have it all figured out, but just start to experiment with this platform idea you brought up, Pavel. I think it's it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thank so you very maybe, much, Mike. David, please. Yes, uh, I mean, there's, there's so much to say and so little time, but number one, uh, you know, workers, workers, workers. Uh, I was so struck this morning, the Institute for Human Rights and Business had a webinar. Uh, they're doing a lot of work uh, around you know, the leadership group for responsible recruitment. And this morning, RBA was represented. It, the focus was Malaysia. And uh, Joanne Chua uh, from the uh, IOM in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia, you know, described what's happened to foreign migrant workers since the COVID-19 and the rollback of some key policies related to government. And one that struck with, stuck with me IOM listened uh, to where, where, where work. David, David, your mic. David, your mic. Yeah. Uh, yep, there was a you. movement, you know, the, the movement uh, control order uh, by the government mm -hmm. had a hugely negative impact on workers that didn't really know that much about COVID-19, you know, were going out. They, many were detained, uh, some jailed and some deported, and IOM stood up and publicly, uh, you know, made statements around that, plus meeting with the, the government to try to address that. You know, I asked whether companies had joined in on that. She said, you know, they hadn't, but I do think there's a role for listening to workers. What are the key elements uh, that, and if it's a crisis like we're in now, got to listen well, but then be willing to act uh, and create a public uh, face to this and do that through collective actions. I think that's important. The other piece is we're working a lot now with worker driven uh, movements, uh, certainly mm -hmm. one in the United States that is made up primarily of workers from uh, Central America and from Mexico coming into the country. And the coalition of Immokalee workers has been working now for 10 or 12 years. 14 major food companies have joined in the fair food program that has transformed. Uh, the recruitment process, there's no longer working through the crew boss. They're, they put a, you know, they've really done a lot around sexual harassment in the fields. So not just recruitment, but also a whole range. And the, the whole possibility there is that workers are in the driver's seat. And I think maybe we need to look at sort of the, as we rebuild the power equations to validate those that have been made most vulnerable by the systems. And I think in this case, IOM really listened in Malaysia and, and did the right thing. And hopefully over time, they haven't stopped trying to meet with the government, et cetera. And now, you know, it, it seems to me that as the investors and the uh, associations uh, need to really step up, we need to keep our ears open to what the workers' uh, needs are. Thank you very much to all of you. I will refrain from commenting, although I've taken lots of useful notes. I'll keep them for my um, other interventions. But I wanted to make sure that we give the floor to some of the participants who have already started to share some interesting questions in the chat. There is specifically one um, on the Caribbean. This is a colleague from IOM who is responsible for the Caribbean Migration Consultation, which is a um, consultative process within the Caribbean to discuss migration issues. I'll read it to you. Uh, there are many issues surrounding the need for SIDS. SIDS is small island, islands development states, which are particularly vulnerable to external shocks to recover their tourism sector. To what extent is the tourism sector dependent on recruitment and in need of improving their ethical recruitment practices? Anyone in particular who feels interested in this um, in this topic, we've, we just for you to, to know, we are trying to launch um, IRIS, the, the tool of IUM, in a number of Caribbean states and also in Central America. 
uh, because specifically we have been contacted by several government institutions screaming for help because um, the kind of exploitation, abuse and general general abuse that is suffered by migrant workers is, is very evident. Um, so I was wondering if maybe David or Bob would like to have anything to say, David? Was it, uh, did you mention the tourism sector? Yes, yeah. it's specifically tourism, yeah. whether it is so dependent on recruitment and in need of improving the ethical recruitment practices. Right. Well, so a lot more work needs to be done. Uh, our organization, the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility, and this Investor Alliance uh, initiative that we launched has really focused on uh, sex and labor trafficking in the travel and tourism sector. So we meet with a lot of publicly traded uh, companies that are in the airline sector, uh, the 12 largest uh, hotel chains uh, in the world. And of course, they, they've been hit really hard uh, by closures, et cetera. But I, I think for us, we look for local partners. So this would be something to pursue uh, from this uh, to, to see what the situation is. But I think recruitment is one of the pieces. Uh, often, when we're thinking about the hotel sector, uh, you know, the, the sex trafficking, which is very much there, uh, you know, kind of forgets that labor is being trafficked into a number of uh, you know, restaurants and hotels, and in the you know a lot of the uh, the workers in the in the sites. There is uh, about a year and a half ago at the the global forum of the. Uh, Leadership Group for Responsible Recruitment and the Consumer Goods Forum, the International Tourism Partnership that has about 12 or 13 of the major uh, hotel chains as members have done a deep dive into trafficking, including affirming uh, the employer pays principle and really working with other sectors. Uh, a lot of work has been done in the Gulf, but I do feel like there's a need to really zero in on that sector as well. And maybe through IOM's work and investors, there can be a strategy. Because right now, it's been, I mean, it's been appalling how, you know, the, as the, the, the economy is shut down, the, the workers most vulnerable have been so uh, treated. So I think their strategies as we move forward and, you know, to maybe the, a new normal, there can be uh, a real focus on the hotel sector because tourism is huge in so many economies and we, we, have, we have to do it right. So I, I think it's a, a need for a collaborative effort and I would definitely bring in the International Tourism Partnership. Thank you very much, David, for this. I, I know that I've seen some WhatsApp exchanges as well, and I know that some other colleagues are preparing questions. But in the meantime, I know I, I actually see that we have hit onto the time limit, but I wonder whether I could just sneak in a quick question that has always burned into my mind, especially working on the promotion of, of IRIS throughout this area and in Canada and the US. Some of the challenges that we encounter while providing support to governments, uh, recruitment agencies and employers in Canada and the US is to convince the small businesses, the small to medium enterprises that, of course, um, cannot rely on, you know, big shoulders. Um, and so who are quite scared, to be honest, so they, they come to us saying, look, you know, this is really interesting, but um, we're really scared of, of losing the business. Any recommendation that you could give us there? I mean, this is a question that could be for Mike, Bob, or David, I suppose. I don't know, whoever wants to go ahead. I guess I could try. I mean, you know, when we, we have suppliers, yeah, sure. We have suppliers or agents that, that are transparent about what's going on. That, that's really what we want, you know, mm -hmm. understanding challenges, even if they aren't going to get an A passing grade. You know, if, if they were chosen as a supplier to us, for other reasons, we want to work with them to make them ethical and, and put in the right practices. So what we really look for very quickly is a commitment to change. Are they willing to commit to adjust? Because um, we all know eventually, quote, the truth comes out, right? As the more people look at, at things, it's just going to come out. And, and now is not a bad time, I don't think, to be kind of sharing 
your business model and it, it, what might have been okay in the past, that was okay then, right? We were all kind of in that same space together. Now is a bit of, uh, I don't know, maybe amnesties is too strong of a word, but you know, a period where which you can, you can kind of bring these issues out and say, okay, hey, I, I realize this is my business model, but I'm willing to change. How do we go about that in a way that allows me to continue on and, and make lives better for people? And I think med, you will find many larger companies be supportive of that because finding good suppliers is hard work. Mm -hmm. Very you know, uh, way to put it. Thank you, Mike. Please, Bob. No, I was going to echo. I, I think that there is a, um, a good understanding and awareness, eyes wide open, that this is going to be a process and not an event over time, especially with smaller, lower margin businesses. Um, but the first step, again, is establishing the, the reality that we want on the ground, educating those smaller suppliers and working directly with them to, to build a path towards um, ethical recruitment and employment. Um, there's no other way about this. Otherwise, we're just, uh, we're aiding and abetting, um, you know, dead bondage, right? Um, and so this is the time to, to not shy away from it, but look for a path through it. This is very interesting. I will definitely keep this in mind to put in a good words for small to medium um, enterprises mm -hmm. whenever we encounter them um, on our pathways. Well, thank you very much. David, I can see, no? Well, yes? So, yes? I mean, there's one specific uh, piece here that, that comes to mind on your question, and that is uh, because of the, uh, the apparel sector being hit so hard, uh, mm. and particularly starting in Bangladesh, uh, the international organization employers, uh, the ILO, uh, uh, you know, ITUC, and about 11 uh, companies, European and U.S. Uh, apparel companies, uh, signed this call to action around COVID-19 mm -hmm. and to raise money for the you know, it's small business suppliers as well as workers uh, and work with the IFC and the World Bank and reach out. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's happened recently just within the last uh, four or five days is the EU has... Uh, pledged 131 uh, million dollars uh, to uh, you know to Bangladesh and the garment sector, uh, and that I think is a beginning. It, it, it's not one country because it's a it's global, and that the fund is global. But to see the trade unions, the employers, uh, the, you know, a number of brands and retailers stepping up and signing this call, I think is uh, positive. Uh, we need to see more evidence, but they're certainly working together. And who does who does it benefit? It that it really benefits some very small business who are businesses who are suppliers to some of the large uh, apparel brands, as well as to the workers. So we can figure out ways, and the resources may not appear to be there, but we need to find the ways to get it to where they're needed. Very convincing point, Davy. Thank you for adding this in. I realize that we are eight minutes over the allowed time. I can see that there is an extra, um, no, it's a comment really that is coming from a colleague in Mexico and she's recommending to share the Montreal recommendations uh, on recruitment with the counterpart mm -hmm. um, at the Ministry of Labor. Actually, we have already shared that document, but unfortunately it is still in English. So we'll make sure to translate it into Spanish because we know that in our region, if a document is not not in Spanish, it's read by a very um, little minority of people. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that a lot of people actually speak English, they still understandably so prefer mm -hmm. to read it in Spanish. All right, I will then call it today. I would like to um, thank all our distinguished panelists for um, first of all accepting our invitation to this panel and for so eloquently explaining and, um, well, presenting various very specific examples of challenges and recommendations and recommended action that can be taken and they should be taken as a way to deal with, indeed, uh, the fear of, of, of exposing themselves or the fear of um, 
identifying risk, exploitation, but in order indeed to, to change what we have at the moment, and mm -hmm. especially during this challenging time of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that the uh, participants have retained some of the important issues that have been discussed over here. We want to um, remind participants that we remain available on our emails, especially IOM, to be able to take further questions or mm -hmm. clarification that would be needed. I'll type my email in the chat and um, wishing you all a very, very good rest of the week. And thanks again for participating. It was lovely meeting you all. Thank lovely you so much. You, Thank you. Bye. Take care.